All right, this is uh, my talk on uh, history of uh, WRT and wireless mesh protocols. Um, my goal is to give you a uh, technical understanding and history of uh, WRT firmware and a few other things. Uh, basically break down as much terminology as possible, uh, but also uh, not to bore you. I, I like to have interesting things on the slides to make things more funny and interesting. And uh, I have a goal now since my previous talk here. Uh, every talk I have to have either a Pokemon reference or a dick joke on it, on my slide deck. Uh, so to start off, um, <laughs> which that one had both. Uh, to start off, um, who has uh, aftermarket firmware on their uh, router? Anybody? All right. Uh, OpenWRT, DDWRT, which ones you guys? Okay. Uh, tomato at all? Anybody tomato? Okay. Uh, so um, I was looking for an image of a Linksys router with a big spoiler on it, but I couldn't find one of those, so I, that substituted pretty well, though. Uh, let's talk about the modern-day ben modern benefits of uh, aftermarket firmware uh, before I dive into the actual history of that. So who's here heard of anything called uh, Joel's Backdoor? Anybody? Uh, so basically on a D-Link router, yeah, it's very inappropriate, I know. Uh, <laughs> On a D-Link uh, router, uh, somebody actually did a, uh, I think it was like a bin walk on it, and actually they threw it through uh, IDA. Uh, but they kind of uh, figured out uh, when you actually go to the web interface, uh, you don't even need a password. If your user agent string was on the uh, browser with a certain thing, um, you actually, oh my god, you cannot read that at all. But the highlighted part right there where it said uh, XML set and then it says something in there, it's actually Joel's back door spelled backwards. And if you have that for your user agent string, you don't even need a password for the router. Uh, this was uh, found in 2011. D-Link took a little bit to uh, push out the update. Uh, some actual other ones that are out there, they've not pushed updates for them, and they still have backdoors on them. Uh, Netgear is one another one, too, that had a pretty famous one. I think it was like in 2006, uh, Superman or something like that. I forget what it was exactly. Uh, but the funny thing about this is that even though it was founded in 2011, after doing the uh, uh, decompile of it, uh, they found in a message board on a Russian website in 2008 that, that that string was already posted in there. So this was kind of known for a while. Uh, but it's not just uh, standard home office home routers, too. Uh, we all heard about this one, Juniper. Uh, so there's there's been a lot of backdooring. It's uh, kind of a common thing. Theirs was a little bit more uh, kind of unique, though. It actually looked like a part of the code, uh, but it was actually a, uh, you know, something for the backdoor access. So there, there's a large list of um, router firmware that are, are uh, exploits for uh, firmware, including like more corporate ones. I think Ubiquiti is in there, yeah. Um, so uh, home use and then also some more enterprise. And um, if you go on there, you'll see it's just, it's sad. It's really sad. And the, the saddest part about it is that some of these vendors have not come up and said, okay, well, we'll address it. Those are still, some of these exploits around there are still public. So let's talk about the benefit of aftermarket firmware. Uh, it's open source, so um, you actually get to see the code. So if somebody puts a back door in there, they have to be very, very smart when they come to that. Um, the other thing is that uh, a lot of these uh, vendors, like for example, OpenWRT specifically, when they came out with the Heartbleed, they actually uh, had an update for the package the day of. So um, who here actually, when Heartbleed came out, you had to wait at least a week for their vendor to update the thing. Anybody? A weeks? Months? Anybody months? Anybody still have it? <laughs> Somebody's still bleeding out? Okay, just want to make sure. Um, you don't have to raise your hand, though. I won't call you out. Um, but um, it's really easy. For example, in OpenWRT, they have a package manager called OPKG, which is kind of like their Debian package man. It's like Debian-based. So you do run OPKG update, and then OPKG install uh, op um, open SSL and it'll update all that for you. Um, the other benefits is that you take your home router into more of an enterprise security. So you get the capability of VLANing, IPsec, OpenVPN, WPA with Radius. So if you want to actually, uh, instead of just one key, you could actually base it off a Radius server. Um, IDS, you could uh, use Snort on it. Um, and then uh, NF tables or IP tables, the old stuff. Um, other benefits, the non-security related though, is that you could uh, increase your uh, transmit power of your radio, which I'm not really fond of. Uh, a lot of people initially did that just to like, oh, I get more range. It really, you're indoors. It's not going to help you out. Um, 
you got a brick wall. <laughs> it doesn't matter how much you increase it. The other thing is that it actually really does screw with the uh, spectrum a bit too. Uh, advanced QS settings, you get off of that. A better web interface. Uh, for example, Tomato is my favorite out there for web interface. Um, NFS, CFS share. So if you want to do your like uh, file sharing through Windows stuff like that, you could access your router through that. Uh, web server. Uh, some of them even have like an NCHEC server built into it. And why you want to put that on your router, I have no idea, but it has that capability. Uh, hotspot capability. So uh, when you access your wireless thing, you could actually send in your username and password, and then you get a DHCP lease. Uh, has USB storage, USB air card, USB print server, U uh, U UPS USB support. So if, uh, for example, if your uh, UPS says or goes out or power goes out, UPS will kick something through the USB cord saying that you know, you know, power's out, yo. Um, and then uh, basically your uh, router will actually you could just set up as an SMTP server and send out an email saying, hey, power's out at home. The list goes on though. There's a lot of stuff you could do with aftermarket firmware. Fundamentally, what it comes down to is that your router now is a full-fledged Linux operating system. So how did uh, WRT come about? Um, it actually started with uh, uh, the Linux, uh, Linux kernel mailing list and also a little bit of Seattle wireless. Uh, basically, uh, I'll read that out real loud so people could giggle to that too. Uh, I, the lawsuit I won against uh, condom company is the reason why you'll be going to a good college someday. Um, but uh, basically, uh, between the Linux kernel mailing list and uh, Seattle Wireless, they kind of kept poking at Linksys saying that you clearly have a uh, Linux-based um, firmware and we do not see any source code and you're completely violating it. Uh, this was kind of the posting on there, which you probably can't read as well. But basically, they went through there saying that they disassembled it. They realized it was a CRAMFS file system and they could see that what version of Linux. They're using also BusyBox, which is another... Uh, GPL-based software. So they kept doing that. Uh, the first few emails that were basically saying, hey, yeah, we'll take care of this. And then they magically disappeared. And uh, for a while, um, more and more people poked them. And uh, since it's 2003, GPL was kind of a newer concept. I mean, it's been out for a while, but for a lot of corporations, they didn't know how to deal with that. And Linksys was also a pretty smaller company at that time, as opposed to now, you know, in 2003. So what they did, uh, they freaked out and just actually released the whole source code without thinking about it. Uh, the, the, the downside is that um, when you violate GPL license, you're supposed to release the code you change. So if you have like an Apache web server and you have forward slash, you know, in your forward slash W directory where you have all your, you know, custom stuff that you made, that does not have to be released. Only code that you affected on the source code for like Apache you have to release. Uh, so configuration, stuff like that. But they ended up releasing it all, and including the uh, Broadcom drivers. So that kind of uh, gave us, gave the people more of a benefit of understanding how these devices worked, and it pretty much gave a uh, jump start. So everyone started uh, jumping on the bandwagon and uh, started making uh, WRT firmware. So I'm going to go start talking about the uh, distros that kind of early contributed to it, uh, and then going on there, talk about other ones out there too. So the earliest contributors would be uh, Sevstoff and probably Wi-Fi Box and uh, HyperWRT. Uh, a lot of these nobody probably ever heard of. Um, the weird thing about this is that at this time in 2003, the internet was a different beast. Uh, Sevstoff was like one of the few companies that I ever seen that actually scrubbed that off the internet. Um, uh, basically, they they started with uh, a model that started oh, free to download and use. And then they started selling the different versions of it that had a lot of support. Uh, these ones had like a IPsec, VPN, uh, ability to increase your transmission radio. They implemented uh, some mesh technology in them early on. Uh, they ended up walling the uh, support for it and making a $20 uh, a year uh, fee of it. And a lot of people are pissed off about that. Um, what it came down to is that um, they're taking open source code and then remaking it a little bit, and then selling their open source code, which they sold the binary, and then they released the source code in a different way, which I think was in a way technically legal, but super p it pissed off a lot of people. Um, they also, uh, this guy was notorious being in a, a complete a-hole. Uh, he ended up like threatening people that released the binaries on the like various websites. Um, he also, uh, a lot of the binaries too were shared through peer-to-peer uh, -peer networking like email and all this uh, other stuff back in the day. Um, 
but the people that did that, he like there was actually a thread of one guy where he threatened his family. I mean, it was like borderline mafia style, and he was notorious at doing that stuff. He also, this image right here was uh, sup that stuff that he took from the peer-to-peer -peer sharing, re-injected that with a different firmware. So people downloaded this firmware, they could have sets off, but it was just an actual blank uh, image. So when they update their firmware, they would access their their web portal, their their you know their 192.168.1.1, and then they would actually go to that image with nothing in there and saying that you pretty much why would you download bootlegged copies? So uh, one of the people, uh, Brain Slayer, created uh, DDWRT, which was a uh, clone of Sevsoft that branched off and did some things. Um, eventually, DDWRT um, took because Sevsoft as a company kind of died out over time. Uh, I think it was like 2010. Uh, now they use the uh, OpenWRT kernel, but they kept the uh, interface to be kind of similar what they used to have for Seth stuff. You can see, can kind of see the uh, similarities between this and the Tailsman, um, but that's essentially what they did. So big contributors to uh, the adoption of uh, WRT firmware, Seth stuff, of course, Wi-Fi box. Earthlink uh, actually had, um, they were trying to switch over to IPv6 which ended up, I don't think they cared to switch over um, like everyone else. But they were like, how can we do this cost effective? Let's buy a bunch of Linksys routers and make our own WRT firmware that supports IVP6. So that, that's pretty much what they did. Um, so that was kind of a cool thing that somebody took an open source project at that time and you know, made it more into their corporate needs. Uh, Hyper WRT, uh, which nobody really knows, but people have heard of probably Tomato firmware. And uh, Tomato is based off of a Hyper WRT. OpenWRT, which is very common, a lot of support. Um, and then you could also see the branches under there. Gargoyle, DDWRT, XWRT, uh, Robin, which is basically a uh, mesh-based uh, firmware, and uh, Kira WRT are all OpenWRT-based distros. Another one is Oleg, uh, which was one of the original adopters of USB support for uh, the HyperWRT firmware. So. First is Tomato Shibby. Uh, the problem with Shibby is that it supports only Broadcom chipsets. Uh, so you don't really get you know, your Theros, Qualcomm, Rylink, or all the other stuff for support. It's an easy learning curve. Uh, the biggest benefit is the uh, Ajax interface. It is very easy to use. It's amazing looking, especially when you're using QoS, QoS tables. Uh, it's uh, pretty much full featured if you use like Tomato, for example, or the Shibby version. Uh, there's many different variants, like the one before Shibby came out was more of a Toast Man, was they used a lot, but you get all that support in there. You even has it, the newest version, the uh, all-in-one has a full NGX server in there. No mesh support, though. Uh, it's strictly just an access point. Uh, OpenWRT is definitely by far the most advanced. It's a literally a whole Linux distro. You have your OPKHE package manager to download and install things like uh, your you know, advanced support like IDS, like Snort, uh, higher level protocols if you want to install Zebra to do BGP on a router, which I have no idea why you want to put BGP on a MIPS processor, but you can do stuff like that. You have, you know, the, the whole world's up, up, up at your axis with uh, OpenWRT. Uh, DDWRT, it's great because it's new friendly and you probably heard of it. I'm um, not a big fan of it. It's died out, they don't really support it. It's very bloated, but um, it's easy to, and to use because there's a good amount of documentation on it. Gargoyle is another cool one. If you want something very simplistic, uh, it's OpenWRT based, uh, but it has a really easy user, user interface uh, and very uh, easy to set up uh, bridge mode. Um, here's some other free non-WRT based firmware. Uh, you have your free BSD distro based, which is Monowall, which kind of died out, which is part of now PFSense. I think PFSense recently forked too. I forget the name of it. Um, but um, that's more like your enterprise. It supports x86 only, just like uh, Epfire, which is a Linux base, and it's uh, more geared towards enterprise. So if you're going to be thrown on a Xeon server with a bunch of uh, NIC cards, you could do a lot more with that. Other uh, partially proprietary, when I mean partially proprietary versus free, I'm not talking about cost, free as in freedom, um, proprietary as in uh, you know, closed source binaries and all the other stuff. Uh, Linux has a thing called Viant. I'm not sure. Has anybody here called heard of Viant before? It's used a lot in ISPs, uh, bro code, uh, brocade. I mean, uh, routers, um, and also uh, your uh, ubiquity stuff uses some of that. 
Uh, router OS, is, which is another very common one in the wireless industry, they're uh, used by uh, Microtech. Uh, it's pretty much the go-to for that. They're actually a tiered service, so if you get a Microtech router, an access point, for certain features you have to pay like a level uh, 5 firmware, and then you get more features on it. Uh, BSD-based, Juno OS, Juniper. Uh, VxWorks is a kind of a smaller embedded one, it's more for like mesh networking, uh, small devices. Also, Linksys now used VxWorks because they were pissed off that Link, uh, Linux ended up uh, kind of pushing them out that market, so they ended up going to a proprietary uh, distro to make that. Cisco IS, I'm sure everyone here heard of Cisco IS. It's a monolithical kernel. Um, the interesting thing about um, Cisco IS is that the, uh, there is no preempt process for the kernel. Uh, so if you're trying to run something that's multi-threaded and high availability, it will not support that, and they did not want to pr pretty much redo the kernel because it would break a lot of legacy applications. So there is a thing called Cisco IOS XR, which is more of their high-end, high availability routers, which actually uses the uh, QNX kernel, which is a BSD microkernel. Um, one of the bigger contributors to uh, WRT uh, was uh, Buffer Bloat. It's kind of more of a recent thing. They basically took um, the concept of the network schedulers. Majority of them out there are kind of first in, first out. So when you actually got a packet coming through your network, you basically have a way of saying, okay, wait the queue, and if you're needed, it will throw you in there, um, and then we'll keep going and stuff like that. Um, they ended up re kind of taking more of a mathematical approach. There's other ones out there that do mathematical approaches, but this was a very uh, elaborated way of doing it. They did more of a square root uh, intervals. So basically, if packets are delayed too long, they'll end up dropping it, which happens to begin with, but they use more of a mathematical equation of saying, okay, this is going to be queued that long. We'll know that it's going to be dropped anyways. Uh, so basically it helps with the jitter. It also helps with the uh, throughput. And overall, they, this guy tested it with various different ISPs. So like your DOCSIS modems, your cable modems, your DSL, uh, your um, MPLS networks, stuff like that. And they got about like almost like a 10% gain. And this was all open source contribu contributors. And they used the... Uh, Kiro WRT, I'm not sure if I can move my mouse over there, but that was the distro they used to uh, utilize that. So let's uh, talk about also wire wireless mesh. So that's another big thing that kind of came out of uh, the open source side of WRT. Uh, the original uh, RFC was called Mainnet, which is Mobile Ad Hoc Networking. It came out in 1999. Uh, it was a combination between University of Maryland and uh, Naval Research Laboratory. Um, it was more a concept. It wasn't an actual protocol. When you look at an RFC, you're thinking, okay, this is how the protocol works. It's more like a guideline that for future use, if you're going to make a mesh protocol, this is the best way to do it. And then people kind of built upon it. Uh, before we dive into the different types of uh, mesh protocols, let's talk about more of the why mesh exists and what the benefits of that. So with uh, most routing protocols, they're designed for a finite connection. You're assuming that your Cat5 cable after 100 meters is going to either die out or, or have connection. So um, they're not built around um, sporadic behaviors that wireless you'll get with wireless. So if you have um, you know, outside weather effects or if you have um, other radios that are on the same channel broadcasting, creating noise, that will affect the speed dramatically and also maybe drop something off. Um, so the, that's one of the biggest problems with most routing protocols is they don't assume that it will happen. Also, uh, on top of that, wireless devices can be mobile. So you have infrastructure mode versus ad hoc mode. Uh, infrastructure is pretty much what everyone knows and uses. Your cell phone right here, when you communicate through, when you communicate through it, uh, it's actually the same thing as infrastructure mode. You have an access point, aka your cell phone tower, to your station, which is your cell phone. And that's the same what you use at home. Um, there is a thing called ad hoc mode, which is a different mode. Uh, it's basically an independent basic set service. It acts as its own kind of repeater. It's its own way to transmit and receive. It doesn't really ha know how to route. That's where the mesh protocol comes in. So essentially, uh, a mesh protocol utilizes ad hoc devices. It's decentralized. So if something breaks down in that chain of command, 
it knows how to, in its own routing protocol to move to the next node. It also, um, if one node fails, it doesn't bring everything down. So, um, I'm gonna, who, who, who watches Walking Dead? So, a network engineer went to the doctor, shut up, Dad. He told, he told the doctor, it hurts when I pee, Carl. It hurts when I pee. Um, so, uh, the biggest problem when you're designing a protocol is that you can't assume that it's gonna be one type of data. You have you know, various different types of uh, data protocols going through there. You have your TCP, you have your UDP, you have your ICMP, echo request, hello, are you there? You have your UDP, you have your multicast, you have your broadcast, you have your anycast, which I just learned about recently, anycast, and then you also even have your UDP traffic. I don't know if anybody noticed, I did repeat UDP three times. It's essentially the honey badger of networking protocols. Doesn't give a shit. <laughs> so, your types of uh, wireless mesh network at WMN. You have, uh, it could be broken down really three different categories. You have your proactive, which is table driven. Um, your reactive, which is on demand, and suboptimal. So your proactive, it maintains a fresh, smooth, baby face list of all of your destination routes. Uh, the biggest disadvantage is that obviously if you're updating your routing table, you have to let all the nodes know, hey, this is gonna happen. Uh, thus, uh, not really designed for a large scale mesh network that constantly has things dropping in and out a lot. These, uh, are the types of uh, proactive. You have your optimized link state routing, a babel. Uh, you also have your distance sec sequenced uh, distance vector, DSDV. Open uh, short uh, path first, or shortest path first. Now you have reactive routing. Reactive basically uh, kind of updates on the fly where your routes are. Biggest disadvantage is access flooding, um, high latency. But the great thing about this is that if you have like a sensory network where things sleep a lot, it doesn't really affect it a whole lot, and it's really good to work around with that. You have uh, these th are your kind of your three types, and there's other ones out there, and especially on the proprietary side. But these are more your three type: your uh, dynamic source routing, uh, ad hoc on demand distance vector, and then hybrid uh, me wireless mesh protocol. So if you see anything that's like 802.11.s, that's actually using that type of protocol to reactive. And then you have your reactive, or sorry, and then you have your suboptimal. Uh, so suboptimal is basically something that doesn't really fit in either of those categories. There's my Pokemon reference, if anyone wanna know. Uh, so you have your ZRP zone routing protocol, which is kind of a hybrid between them both. And then Batman, which doesn't really fit in either of those categories. So let's talk about uh, the whole concept and how a lot of this wireless mesh came about and the big contributors to that. Uh, so it started with a uh, group called Freifunk. Uh, basically, it's a uh, German word for free radio. It's a kind of a grassroots initiative. It started off as a hobby to build your own free internet and it, to the collaborating people around there. And then it became more of a thing where it's developed for people that are activists to go around net neutrality. It's mostly in Belgium and Germany and stuff like that. Um, the earliest one was uh, OL OLSR, so your optimized link state routing. Uh, and there's the information on there. You got your RFC number, it was in 2003, backed by INRIA. It's a French um, kind of an institute. I wouldn't say it's a college, but it's a bunch of uh, technical people that build a lot of standards. Um, designed for multi point relays, so basically it uh, looks for the least amount of hops in the where the closest multi point relay and make sure that the uh, uh, link is active at that state. Does not include um, link quality. It was added later as an addition. Um, at that time though, um, they were messing with the protocol. They added more packages to it. It kind of didn't go the same approach that they wanted. So somebody came out with a thing called Batman, which just stands for a better approach to mobile ad, ad hoc networking. 2008, it was uh, designed as a replacement for LSLR. Um, it's Weird protocol, because what it does is it takes the nearest neighbors and reaches out to them saying, hey, I need to go to this destination. So it's a kind of a small, like each node itself creates a small list of what the best routes are. So you don't have a massive routing table for all that. Um, so no, no single node has all the data. Uh, it's considered uh, a draft still, due to the fact that it's constantly being heavily uh, developed. Um, 
and then uh, they ended up adding it to layer two support. So instead of being, which most of the mesh protocols were layer three and network layer, they moved it to the uh, data link, mostly because they wanted to um, understand the link quality. And when you're trying to deal with the link quality, you're closer to the kernel itself, so they made it layer two. And then they also implemented it into the kernel. It's uh, actually in the Linux vanilla or Linux mainline since uh, 2011. And the um, kind of things that came out of the Batman Advance were just kind of already different iterations that already exist. Some unique things with it. Um, there's a lot of development and constant add-ons to it. Uh, one is uh, allows a gateway server. So uh, when you're dealing with the actual traffic, you're you're trying to look for the nearest gateway out to the internet, and you could dedicate you know these nodes go to that one. So it creates a broadcast domain in there. So if something is going to the left and it's trying to hit a gateway server, it's not going to broadcast anything to the route because to the right. So since it knows the gateway server is over there. So the broadcast domain is not like a subnet. It's more of an actual uh, what all the neighbors are going to that gateway. Uh, bridge loop avoidance, nothing new. Um, people have dealt with STP before. Uh, it's different, though, because it incorporates link quality in a different well, mathematical way of use, utilizing it. You have access point isolation. So um, it kind of stops from a node talking to another node. So in order for a node to communicate to another node, it has to go all the way back up to the gateway and then send the data back. It's there for security reasons, of course. Multicast optimization, which is kind of going back to that gateway server thing. Uh, Multi-link optimization, some um, access points will have multiple radios, so you could use that as kind of a cha channel bonding or teaming or whatever you want to use for that terminology, so you're combining the two bandwidth together. Network coding uh, is kind of a unique thing that they created. It basically um, takes data packets, instead of releasing them multiple, always you know, at the same time, they look for certain things and kind of bind them for uh, one larger packet. So it increases latency a little bit, uh, but it increases the throughput a lot. Babel is another one. Came out in 2011. Uh, it's a loop avoidance or loop avoiding distance vector routing protocol. It basically combines a lot of the concepts that Cisco used, other mesh protocols used into one elaborated, very robust, and uh, very good at uh, converging different routings uh, all together in one package. It's part of the uh, quad routing suite which is common in most routers. And then uh, recently they came out with OSLR version 2, which is more of a uh, same exact thing as the original one. They added more flexibility and modular design on it. Uh, the biggest difference is that this one's considered standard track, so it's non-experimental, it's stable, and it's supported by a lot by large corporations. So that's uh, pretty much my presentation there. So anybody have questions? I know I probably bored you at the last minute with all the technical stuff. I should have probably thrown a dick joke somewhere in there between that at the end. Um, uh, Germany. Uh, they have, uh, <laughs> they have, Freifunk is a group that's over there. They actually have a huge uh, network. Also, Mesh is very common in uh, like um, your Internet of Things protocol, stuff like that. So instead of having a radio that transmits a lot of data, or large radio that communicates all the way back to the main server, they'll hop off each other to back to the actual, to the gateway. So it's there for like smaller actual radio sizes. The other benefit is that you could, if you and your, all of your neighbors want to just jump on the bandwagon right now, you could build your own ISP. So you have one person bringing fiber into their home, and then you have a mesh network, and they all communicate, and you don't have to pay Time Warner any fees. There, that's an example. But it's, it's pretty much a different type of routing protocol that, you know, you could utilize a lot better, a lot more benefit off of wireless technology. Anybody else with questions? Oh, Where does Zigbee fall? Uh, that's hardware layer. So Zigbee, um, I don't think there is a mesh protocol in the Zigbee. Okay, I don't know what it's called. I know, like for example, uh, Wi-Fi has their 802.11s. And I'm assuming Zigbee has their own type of thing, which would probably be the same exact thing where it's more of a uh, sensory base, so it's reactive. Um, and I assume Z-Way probably has the same thing. There's also, I mean, a networking protocol it could be built upon anything. So if you have a Zigbee, you could make your own network protocol with that. Um, and with, like, for example, Batman, it, or even any other protocol, really, um, you, you, you put it in your Linux kernel, as long as something can run it through Linux, it really doesn't matter at all. 
So you could use WiMAX if you want for a mesh network. Anybody else with questions? Okay. Well, thanks for coming.